right. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another DCSD town hall. We're going to get kicked off here in about two minutes. So until then, just go ahead and get comfortable. Grab a uh, grab a, a drink, a, a snack. If it's too early for dinner. We'll get started in about two minutes. All right, good evening families and community members of Douglas County School District and thank you for joining us for another town hall meeting. My name is Nate Jones, I'm the communications manager for the uh, Douglas County School District and I'll be serving as moderator once again for today's discussion. Today we are talking about uh, the full-time in-person return for secondary students. We're scheduled for an hour today and I would like to start by thanking our community members who RSVP'd for this event and, uh, and submitted their questions for us to address here this evening. Um, a quick reminder that any questions that we do not get to during the course of the town hall, uh, we'll still supply answers for those questions. They'll be up on our website at dcsdk12.org. Uh, from there, just click on the tab at the top that says Road to Return. Uh, and from there, there's a Frequently Asked Questions tab that you can click on, um, as well as a dashboard that I'm sure we'll plug a couple more times throughout the evening because um, that is where you can find the latest information for COVID cases in our school district. Joining me for this conversation, as always, is uh, really the star of the show, Interim Superintendent Corey Wise. Corey, thank you for being here. Uh, I know that you're joined this evening by uh, several members of your district leadership team, uh, the superintendent's cabinet. Thank you to all of our panelists that are with us today. After some opening remarks, we'll go ahead and answer some of those questions that we've received from community members. But I do want to take a moment before we, we begin to once again thank our DCSD Board of Education directors for being here and supporting, uh, continuing to support our, our, our town hall meetings. Uh, so a shout out to uh, directors David Ray, Krista Holtzman, Kevin Lung, Anthony Graziano, Christina Chancho Shore, Elizabeth Hansen, and Susan Meek. Thank you so much for your continued support, directors. Um, so we are going to start off with some opening remarks from Corey Wise, our DCSD interim superintendent. Well, Nate, thank you. Uh, Christian, Stacy, all of our communications to uh, cabinet and, and district staff who are here to help uh, help me in this process. Thanks for being here. Um, to everyone out there, hey, just want to want to reach out and say thanks for spending a little time together. Uh, always appreciate the conversations and the questions and trying to provide uh, more information uh, to our whole community and our system. And so thanks for, uh, thanks for joining tonight. You know, I want to, I want to just start with the excitement I have for returning full in person. And, and, uh, it almost feels like the start of a new school year. It's, you know, as you're reading everything right now going on and listen to the, to the news, it's been one year. We think about one year in which, uh, since we've since been full PK 12 in person and, you know, it's exciting, but I also want to, to reiterate that, um, you know, as we start to move back, we're going to have to be continue to be um, understanding, continue to be adapt and responsive. Uh, you know, the, the full in person creates a lot of great opportunities. We want we want that uh, last fourth quarter to finish strong. But, you know, as we stayed in different different messages, whether it be at the board meeting or, or soups on or the letters going out that we still are going to be following, following the, uh, the mitigating factors. We all need to wear our masks. So being back full in person uh, is going to be a little more normal, but we're still going to have quarantine practice. That's required. You know, I get a lot of questions about the quarantine process and, 
And do know that while it's evolving, we want to ask questions. Uh, Tri-County works with CDPHE, but this starts at a state level of what's required on Tri-County and then what's required onto us that, uh, you know, we need to, to look at how do we maintain this? How do we do this well for our students? And we're going to continue to wear our masks. So, you know, three weeks ago in a cabinet meeting, I was having conversations saying, you know, I hear the providers talking about vaccinations, but we need action. How are we going to implement? And to see the response within two weeks of the number of invites that went out, the number of staff that were able to get vaccinated and to hear from teachers and staff that, you know, last week we're starting to get our second vaccinations and this week also, and to be able to, to create a plan that talks about not only returning in person, but also having our staff vaccinated and a lot of them having that 14 days where they won't have to quarantine. It's a sustainable approach for our staff. It creates a safety piece. And, uh, you know, that's what I'm really excited about. I think, you know, the, the, the way in which we are to provide a number of providers, I want to say thanks to Nancy Ingalls and her, her team and, and to everyone, Holly, uh, who, was a part of setting up our clinic this past week that hadn't received one and still wanted one. So, you know, I feel strong that all of our, our staff and employees that wanted a vaccination have every opportunity to get it. And, uh, and we're ready. So, you know, as much as it's going to be different, we're ready. Now, what I'd ask of you is, is we are, it's March 9th, you know, we're going into spring break and, and as always in this March timeframe, we look at the amount of snow and the predictions going into this weekend with snow. Um, you know, we, we always face that time. So whether it's uh, on our spring break or right before, right after, we always see that increased snow, but we have a lot of activities going on. We are going into um, some of the state competitions and spirit competitions and, and so forth that with snow and with spring break, you know, we want you to enjoy your time. We want you to be energized and ready for the transition but we're also going to ask you to think about uh, responsibility. And, you know, if you do travel or if you have any symptoms coming back in and getting ready to come back in, uh, please, 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 you know, have your students get, have your children get tested. You know, we have our Colorado COVID check. We have Mako and Lone Tree. Uh, we have a, a, a site at Douglas County High School where you can come in and get tested through our services free. And you can also use your primary care physicians and your services in which you get tested. But we would ask you in coming back to have that responsibility. You know, I'm not going to tell you uh, how to live your life, but I also want you to know that we need to continue to have our mitigating factors. We need to continue to, to say, if you feel like you've been exposed or added risk, get tested. And it's not just about one test. Anytime you might have symptoms of not feeling well, let's get our students tested. Um, let's come back and try to provide that aspect where, where we can work through it. Remember with all of it, whether it be quarantines and the way in which after five days of asymptomatic, we can get a negative test and start to return after day eight. And or if we ourselves have symptoms or test positive and get tested, we can work on that quarantine process to, to try to um, do it safely, but get back as quickly as possible in those exposure times. So, you know, that's just my, my piece that as we get back, there's going to be quarantines. We're going to work through it um, as we plan for next year. You know, we have a lot of stuff in place where our staff will be vaccinated and we're hopeful that even more vaccinations come out that, uh, you know, we have students who are 16 or 18 or older that might have uh, mitigating factors that allows them to get vaccinated. And that's fantastic because it helps students after those 14 days of not having to be vaccinated. Hopefully more parents in our community also continue to get those vaccinations and that creates more normalcy and opportunity. But as we plan for next year, just like coming back full in person this fourth quarter, we as a district with the board have been working to be full on time and planning next year to be full on time. And that full in person is, it's going to be an ever changing piece. We think more opportunities will open up, but to predict where we are now to August, um, a lot, a lot will happen, but uh, the opportunities of hopefully increasing opportunity, increasing access, um, continuing to monitor with Tri-County and CDPHE, what quarantine processes and what all this looks like is going to be exciting to see what happens. And in this ever changing and fast changing environment, uh, you know, in that work, we also want you to know we understand that students might not have access to vaccinations by August. Students might not have access, access to vaccinations uh, even next fall. So we are planning for uh, offering e-learning, okay, that remote side of full e-learning, uh, PK-12 next year. Uh, we understand some students might need that for medical reasons or family members. 
Um, so we had an express check-in that went out to, for you to be able to select what your preference is for the e-learning environment, that remote learning um, that is not tied to your neighborhood school, but really in that e-learning environment, um, which will be a little bit different than next year, but have a lot of similarities, but it'd be fully remote. And then also whether or not you'd want to stay full in person in your school. And we see how much, uh, how well we're doing with not only our positivity rate, but also transmissions, but we'll continue to monitor. And I think that's the, the great side of it, but we, we want to know, and we're trying to build planning for that. You know, the last part is I, as I started off, I'm excited. We're all excited about the opportunity. We ask you to understand, to have empathy, to work with it. It's not gonna be perfect, but how we work through challenges is important. We're here with you. Um, but just knowing that as we go through each of those situations, um, that there's a lot of parameters to that. We're gonna do, try to do a good job of working through each of those and continue to advocate and, and communicate well and create understanding. And that's part of what tonight's for. So, so Nate, I'm gonna throw it back to you with uh, starting the questions and hopefully uh, we can get all the answers uh, out to you. And like Nate said, if we don't answer one uh, in, a, in a question answer piece verbally, uh, we'll be sure to get that back out in writing. And uh, you can access our, our Douglas County website uh, also to get uh, more information in, in the days and weeks to come. That's right. Thank you, Corey. Uh, I also would like to uh, to thank the panelists that are online with us uh, as they'll be assisting uh, Mr. Wise with answering some of the questions that we get uh, throughout the course of this Q&A session. So we're going to start off now with uh, with some questions about the preparation for the transition to full in-person learning. Uh, and our first question comes to us from Todd, and I'm almost wondering if uh, this was prompted by uh, the news that we're getting about eight inches of snow uh, this weekend. Todd wants to know, um, why are high school students asked to continue learning remotely on snow days? Yeah, um, so that's a great question. You know, as we take a look at a number of districts and some districts have moved to remote fully, some districts have continued to have snow days. You know, that's probably a question that I think uh, when you look at what's right, there's going to be a number of arguments. Uh, the value of a snow day, you know, in Colorado, that chance uh, for kids to get out and enjoy it, and also uh, the impact it has with students. But at the high school level, uh, first and foremost, high school instructional minutes, as we start getting close in time, we've had snow days, two snow days. Um, we've had planning days, and we look at our instructional minutes the high school group is also the, the most adept to be able to do remote at a moment's notice. So for those two reasons to ensure the instructional minutes, even in a year that is very complicated and might have flexibility, we always want to ensure those minutes. And now that we're getting uh, close to those, those minutes within all of our high schools, we want to monitor that closely. So we will, uh, if we have any more snow days, uh, we will be on the remote setting, whereas middle school and elementary uh, would have a snow closure. Uh, within that. Great. Thank you, Corey. Uh, next question comes to us from Martha. And her question is, will DCSD offer a longer school year to help students who struggled with hybrid or remote learning? And if not, will students have the option to attend summer schools? Yeah, fantastic question. Within all of our schools, you know, we do realize as we've talked throughout the year, this has been a challenging year for everyone. Um, it's been increased work and, and challenges for parents, increased work and challenges for students, increased work and challenges for, for teachers and staff. So we do know that student learning is different this year. We do know that students have struggled and we're identifying how do we help what's essential? What, do, what does each student need? And so not only are we identifying those essentials and building that currently and for the rest of this year, we're also going to help identify and look at those extensions. We're looking at extended work within this school year and what we can do, but also what extensions could happen over the summer. And then to be quite honest with you, it's gonna continue into next year. So that process of, of working with each school, identifying students and students' needs, what's essential. Um, we've always had things like summer school, summer extension, um, and even uh, advancement opportunities. But really this year for all students and identifying and creating those extended learning opportunities is a key piece. Uh, but that's not just looking for summer. It's also extending what are we doing now? What are we doing for the rest of the fourth quarter? And building that and continuing that on with opportunities over the summer and in years to come. Great, thank you for that. Uh, next up, we've got our first caller for the night. Uh, I believe Desiree is uh, in the Zoom here with us. Desiree, can you hear me? I can, can you hear me? I can hear you. Thanks for joining Great. us. Go ahead and ask your question. 
Yeah, thank you so much for taking my question. Um, my initial question was actually about e-learning and whether it would be offered. So thank you so much for answering that. Um, and secondarily, I wonder um, whether or not you guys will be able to make some sort of way where kids can do their CMAS and other state testing remotely, because as of right now, I've just excused my kids from being tested. I have two um, kids in elementary and middle school. Um, so just curious if that will be something I would like to have them tested, obviously, if there was a way to do it remotely. Yeah. Uh, first off, two fantastic questions. So I'm glad that that I was able to answer the, the question on the e-learning. You know, it, it, it's probably going to be needed for the next school year. And I think every Metro district's planning on that. So we too are planning ahead for that. You know, great question on CMAS and all state testing. We look at PSAT, SAT and CMAS for our students. Uh, it's, it's, a ever, it's everyday topic. Um, and when I say that we look at legislation, what's going on uh, within uh, the legislative uh, system and CDE, we look at not only with each provider of the testing, but will that be able to be provided uh, remotely on top of what can we do within our schools? So I just, I want you to know that that's a fantastic question that we are, we are ready and preparing for the administration of CMAS on multiple levels, because we do have even with our e-learning students, how and when do we, do we build that in? So I want you to know that's uh, ever, ever going uh, within, our, within our process and planning. So as we start to come back, we're gonna build in uh, more communication on, on where we fall and what that looks like. Um, I want you to know that we also, um, as we plan, are going to be prepared for all of our students to take it. And there's a value to taking and doing your best on that test. Uh, we also understand the impact that has on, on families, on instructional minutes and everything else. So there's a lot of variables uh, to that CMAS question, along with, uh, with all of our state testing and timing. And you look at the opportunity of uh, access when you look at opportunity of being in, in person and being able to do that and who and which tests will be able to be administrated remotely, uh, those are not decisions we get to make. We're dependent on, on the states and those testing. Uh, so college board for PSAT and SAT and then on the state with CMAS on those decisions. And so we'll be ready. We'll keep communicating with you, but I want you to know that's a, that's a topic that is uh, paramount uh, within the entire state and every school district and, uh, and we'll get you added detail um, as that changes. And I, I do just want to note, uh, Desiree, that we do have uh, your email so we can get you additional information uh, on that um, as soon as we have it available for you. So thank you for calling in with your question. Uh, we're going to go ahead and, and move on now to a question from Carrie. Uh, she's got a, a question about quarantine protocols. She wants to know, uh, what are they? How are we going to try and minimize how much of the season athletes uh, miss? Yeah, so Kerry, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to have Derek Cheney, uh, our district Ath activities and athletics director, jump on board also. Um, but, you know, the great part with all of our quarantining, um, it has improved. Uh, it's not perfect. Uh, our quarantine process is, is, you know, a requirement, but I get the added uh, impact that it has. But even as uh, the athletics quarantines have evolved at this point, uh, you can also, uh, after five days of asymptomatic, uh, not having any symptoms, you can have your students schedule and get a COVID test. With a negative test, you also can um, get back and out of quarantine on day eight. So when we look at the changes in athletic quarantines, it is similar to all students um, now again, and that's true with students and activities also. Um, you know, we have athletics activities, spirit competitions, We'll have theater performances, choir, band. And so when you look at all those performance side, um, we'll see the opportunity in which uh, with asymptomatic after five days, the ability to get tested. So you can use your own testing sites along with those that I talked about that we provide also with Colorado COVID check. We have a MAKO um, and we also have a, a, a site at Douglas County High School uh, for our community to get access to that too, if that helps you. So. Derek Cheney, uh, I don't know if uh, you're available. I, I think I answered that pretty well, um, but I know you uh, are the expert and would love uh, for you to jump in if you'd like. Yeah, no, just just to add, Corey, I think the only thing um, to add to it, it's, it's actually good news. You know, we, we just, uh, student athletes are ones involved in activities. They do, they can follow the shortened quarantine just like they can for school and for classes. So 
um, that that's a good thing. And it, it, it's, uh, it's kind of a U-turn from where we were a couple of weeks ago. And that's kind of been the challenge for all this is as guidance changed and we follow up through CDPHE and such. So um, I think it's overall good news that for to compete or be on the, in, on the field or participate in a play or whatever it may be, they, they get to follow short and quarantine as well. So uh, that's really where we are with that. Great. Thank you, Mr. Cheney. Appreciate you uh, being available to us uh, this evening to answer some questions. Uh, we are going to pivot now to a, a question. I, we tried to get uh, this person on a uh, phone call. She had wanted to call in, but I did not do not believe we got a confirmation from her. Uh, so I'm going to ask her question in her place. This is from Brianna. Um, she would like to know, uh, for those of us whose elementary age children have not returned back uh, and continued 100% um, e-learning, is there an option for a return to that? Um, and how was the decision made to move back to full-time in-person learning? So it's a great question. Um, you know, if you haven't returned back, I'm going to assume you made the choice to be a part of e-learning for the year or this semester. And each of those transitions would take place um, really as an administrative transfer. So it's only if there's room available at this point, because we've tried to staff and have, have class numbers at that side. Um, if it's on a temporary status that you're a quarantine, you know, that, that process of returning back um, from a remote learning, uh, uh, I think I just explained, but, but I think in each of those times, just like we're looking at the choice for e-learning for next year, um, part of the reason I want everyone to understand is in, in creating that express check-in and creating that selection to be e-learning or remote learning for a long period of time, we have to create staffing. Just like you would in a regular school, in a remote or e-learning school, you try to create number of students per teacher. And when you have a full class load to increase more than that, to have quality instruction, grading, feedback, that's where you look at that, 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 the class numbers and staffing. So when you, create a, when you create a setting and a classroom and a school, it's looking at those overall numbers. So when students transfer back and forth and it increases or decreases to a certain amount, that's what creates um, difficulty in changing all the time or changing in a moment's notice in those timeframes. So we try to build over semester. The semester units are natural transitions. Um, so when you look at a full year choice or a semester choice, uh, such as this year, that's part of the reason of why. You know, once you put staffing in place, we as a budget, so we have a school budget for each of our schools, and that includes uh, our e-learning schools. And if you have uh, two, so you have 60 or, or 50 to 60 students in first grade, that'd be two classes. When you get up to that 65 mark, it becomes difficult, and you get pretty large classes in first grade. So I think in each of those, that's where you allocate your, your money as your budget to hire teachers for appropriate staffing for class size. And so that, that side of uh, moving schools, let alone moving from e-learning back to regular school, um, I just want you to know it comes back to how we are staffed and that's per students in each classroom. And, you know, that's reality. It's not always understood well. Um, I don't know if I'm explaining it well enough to, to understand, but I just really want to put that in terms of, you know, you look at average class size and the lower the grade level, the younger the age, we want to create smaller class size. Um, when you look at the average um, in elementaries, you're looking at a, you know, a 22 to, to 24 at the younger ages. As you get up in the intermediate, you're looking at that 24 to 26. When you're looking at middle school, you're getting close to that 28, 30. And sometimes you have a few more than 30. At that high school level, you have that 28 to 30 also. And so, so I think when you look at that, that's how our budget is used. And at the elementary level, when you have a class of, of 28s at a lower level, that's really big. So we want to keep it smaller. That helps instruction. It helps learning. Um, but that's how money is, is allocated back and forth. And once staffing is set, you can't move the teachers as easily because it has to get down to a certain level. So it gets complicated. But I think on that end, hopefully it answers it and it gives an explanation of what we're also planning for in our next school year with the e-learning piece. And that's why we're asking now and trying to get accurate numbers so we can build our budget and build our staffing appropriately to provide those classes uh, for each individual and at the setting that that is most appropriate. Great. Thank you for that question, Brianna. Uh, we're going to move on to a question from Tim here. He, he'd like to know if a family travels over spring break, should they self quarantine their children prior to returning to school uh, out there on the, on the 22nd? Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask Lisa Cantor to jump in with this on me also, you know, 
number of things over spring break. We want you to enjoy some time with your family. We want you to enjoy time with friends. We understand that, that there might be, uh, you know, the want to need to travel. And I, what I'd ask of you is responsibility. Uh, when you come back, I would ask if you would get your students tested, get your children tested. Um, if you feel like you've been exposed or could be, please, yeah, stay home for a bit and then come back. It's not just about one test. It's about maybe having a couple and looking at that, that time in which you travel and coming back. And if at any point you have any symptoms you're not feeling, well, stay home. Stay home and get tested. Um, so I, I think that'd be my best advice and, and asking everyone to, to do their part. Um, you know, I don't want to tell you how to live your lives at all. That's, but also understand the impact it has on our schools and try to build in those, those cautionary practices. But I would say that too with regular life you know, over the weekends uh, with travel, the, the testing availability is here for you. Please use it. Please jump in and get tested, uh, even if it's after each weekend. If you're out and about and, and doing things uh, or needing to travel, whether it be through athletics activities, family-oriented pieces or other, um, let's use that testing opportunity uh, as much as possible. And then use your judgment of self-quarantine. If, if you can, please use caution. That's going to help your child on top of all of our child and our sustainability of uh, being in person and not having to quarantine other students. Remember, each of our actions impacts others. And just so we can do our part on that end to try to help um, within that. So Lisa, uh, you know, I obviously talked a lot on that, but anything please that, that you'd want to add in your expertise and recommendations. Once again, I think you've um, covered that topic well. I will offer that the CDC has an excellent travel resources page, has uh, requirements for uh, certain areas that you may be traveling to and from, and uh, it's a great idea to follow those recommendations that are listed on that page. Great. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you for being on deck tonight to answer some questions from the community. We appreciate it. Uh, next up, we've got another live caller with us, I believe. Uh, is Michelle on the phone? Pretty sure I saw her in the chat log. I'm going to give it just a, a minute here. Let's see. Hi, Michelle. Can you hear me? Having some trouble hearing her. I can, I can see her on the on the chat box here. Michelle, are you able, are you able to dial in or do you have a microphone? Uh, Michelle, I'm going to have you work with Chris Shaleen. He is uh, occasionally a genius. Um, he's going to work with you to try to get you up uh, so we can hear you. Uh, so we'll come back to you and your question after Chris has had a chance to work with you. Uh, Mr. Wise, we're going to continue with our next question while they're working through some technical difficulties there. Um, let's see here. Here's a, here's a transportation question uh, that we've got from Amy. She wants to know, how does DCSD determine who is eligible for bus transportation? Yeah, so great question. I want to go back a little bit on uh, some clarification. With CMAS, you know, right now and foreseeability, I don't see CMAS allowing anyone to take it remotely. I, you know, you always hope that there's adjustments made, but I also want you to know in reality and how quickly it's coming up on us right after spring break um, that CMAS will, will not be remote. Uh, we did get that, uh, that information. So we don't control that, but we plan for everything. So I just want to go back to, um, I think it was Desiree who had that, that question uh, earlier just to give more specifics back uh, within that information. And transportation is a great topic. Uh, Rich Cosgrove is here with us. I'm gonna let Rich get into uh, this answer because he can answer, uh, he can provide the information a lot uh, more succinctly and specifically than I can. So Mr. Cosgrove, are you available? Yes, Mr. Wise, thank you for the question. On February 8th, the district began its transition back to normal capacity on school buses in collaboration with Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment and Tri-County Health Department. And that means that some routes may have two or three students per seat. This is increased capacity and more students on our buses than we had during the COVID restrictions. Eligibility for transportation was expanded as a result to include elementary school students who live approximately more than one and a half miles from their assigned neighborhood school and for middle and high school students who 
who live approximately more than three miles from their assigned neighborhood school. Bus service is only available to students who attend their assigned neighborhood school. And families eligible for bus transportation have been contacted with information on how to sign up for the bus pass, that is smart tag, and view their bus routes and schedules. But with that said, if you have any questions, go to the transportation website and there's a link to Let's Talk and we can respond. Now we realize the eligibility distance is still higher than it was during pre-COVID. The reasoning is threefold. We have fewer bus drivers due to the budget reductions from last year. We have vacancies in those current positions because of our um, inability to compete with salaries with uh, districts across the front range, as well as the industry with commercial driver's license hires like Safeway, FedEx, et cetera. And um, we also are impacted by COVID. We have drivers with pos positive cases and quarantines and we build those shortages into our daily routes. We anticipate that will be improving over time with vaccines. Eligible students uh, requiring transportation as related service in accordance with their IEP, uh, as well as homeless and foster students are bused, all of them, regardless of the distance to their school. Now, with that said, we are actively working with our budget department um, and we're exploring funding options in this year's budgeting process for increasing those salaries so we can hire and retain bus drivers as well as additional bus driver positions to improve and expand upon our routes, to shrink those radiuses to those schools, as well as start addressing neighborhoods that don't have sidewalks, for example, or separated by major thoroughfares from their schools. These funding increases will be prioritized along with other district funding needs for consideration. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Mr. Cosgrove. Appreciate you spending some time with us this, uh, this evening to answer some questions on transportation. I, uh, I have a feeling we'll be talking to you again here in just a little bit. I did want to try and go back to uh, Michelle because uh, I think that maybe we've gotten through some of those audio issues. Michelle, are you on with us? Yes, I'm here. See, there's a reason we keep Christian around. <laughs> Thank you so much Thank for being you. here tonight. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi, thank you. I just wanted to say, first of all, I'm a substitute teacher and I also have a high school student in DCSD. So I kind of come this question from a few different perspectives. So I just wanted to say that. And first of all, um, uh, the CDC said yesterday that the fully vaccinated people can refrain from quarantine and testing following a known exposure to COVID-19 if asymptomatic. Now, a fully vaccinated person would be 14 days out post second shot, right? So just to clarify that. So my question is, are you going to make fully vaccinated teachers quarantine if a child in their class gets COVID? Um, just wondering about that. Yeah, so Michelle, great question. And just want to say thank you. Thanks for, thanks for being a substitute teacher. Thanks for making a difference and getting involved. Um, you know, I think to all the parents out there, it's uh, all a lot of hard work, but I just want to take it a second to pass on to you. Um, we couldn't do it without you and, and all of the staff and, and everyone involved, but special thank you on that. Yeah, you're correct in that um, anyone who receives a vaccination after 14 days will not have to quarantine. So that's actually students also. And we do have a number of students that might work in, in the medical field or or with a, a senior center and other things that have actually received vaccinations. They have to be 16 or older or 18 or depending on the vaccine. But each of those cases after that 14 day, um, they won't have to, to quarantine. Um, the same is true of positive test. So if I, if I were to test any day in which I don't have to quarantine, the differences with the vaccination, um, in so we're working on that for the rest of the semester. We'll continue to put that out with our, our, our health care advisors, uh, Tri-County, CDPHE, and others uh, to go on with what are best practices around and distance, you know, and, and timing, I should say, of, of uh, the vaccination. So Lisa Cantor, anything else you want to add on that? Because you, again, you're the expert in the area, but uh, Lisa, if you're available and you want to jump in, please do. Sure. Uh, the only thing I would add in addition to that is that um, if a vaccinated person becomes symptomatic, we would ask that you would isolate and get tested. 
Um, as we know, the vaccines aren't quite 100%, and, and there have been cases that they are, it's a very, very low chance. But um, as with any illness, we ask that you don't come to school and you would isolate. But other than that, that quarantine guidance that you mentioned, Mr. Wise, is correct. Thank you again, Lisa, for your expertise. We appreciate it. Uh, Corey, would you would you be willing to um, hop off the, the Zoom and then come back in? I think we've got a bit of an unstable connection. I just want to make sure that, that uh, we're hearing you loud and clear tonight. So while, uh, while Corey is doing that, I'm actually going to have uh, Chris Shaleen bring on uh, our next caller. I believe we've got another one with us this evening. Is Suzanne with us? Hi. Um, thank you for taking my question. Uh, my daughter attends Cimarron Middle School. Um, Excellent. Will, can I, will can I have, I'm sorry, can I have you hold for just a moment while sure. Mr. Wise comes back in? Um, sure. if, you know, if you know any good jokes, we've got a couple, uh, couple seconds to pass here. We appreciate you being with us tonight. <laughs> I wish I had some, I was just trying to rack my brain for dad jokes and they only ever come out when it embarrasses my kids. So they're not around right now. I am powerless, uh, but Mr. Y should be rejoining us here, uh, here in just a minute. And I check with Mr. Shaleen and make sure that he's able to get back on. Looks like Corey's with us. Hey, there right. he is. Although he's named Nancy Ingalls now. So <laughs> apparently part of hopping off was also registering a name change. Mr. Wise, we have Suzanne with us. Hi. And Chris, Chris Shaleen can manage your, your uh, to get your name updated, but Suzanne has a question for you, Mr. Wise. All right. Perfect. All right. Thank you. So my daughter attends Cimarron Middle School, um, and this is a question about transportation. So Will the middle schools work on their tra their traffic issues for parents having to drop off and pick up their children since pre-COVID bus transportation will not be in place? At 50% hybrid, the traffic was manageable, but now at 100% non-hybrid five days a week, it'll be chaos if middle schools, specifically Cimarron Middle School, does not fix their traffic issues. Yeah, and I'm going to let Rich also possibly answer this, but I'm going to speak specifically because my, my daughter's went through Cimarron also. Um, Cimarron's not alone. We have a number of middle schools that even last year, prior to COVID existing, traffic is difficult. The number of drivers we have, along with bus transportation um, and congestion on our, on our roads, let alone our parking lots, it's not ideal. You know, just like with anything, I think, think at the beginning of each school years, we've had to adjust our timing. Um, there's times where, as, uh, as we took our daughters to school and have to drop off, you have to leave earlier. And then as we all get into our routines, you start to see things lightening up. Um, you start to find your right times to get to schools. So to speak to specifically to, to Cimarron, you're right. Um, coming up Canterbury or around Canterbury or on a Buffalo Berry, uh, there's lines of traffic. Um, so I would encourage you to, to leave earlier at pickup afterwards to maybe set a time where you're missing some of the traffic because I'm not so sure there's a way to fix that. So even with the uh, buses that we have in the routes, um, the reality is when you have that many people converging on one site in a very short period of time, um, I'm not so sure there's a great fix to that. You know, Cimarron has a fantastic uh, uh, security guard who gets out there and, and, and works on that traffic. and. And Mr. Rosa uh, is phenomenal in that work of letting kids across the streets. Uh, but I also want to be real with you in saying, uh, you know, with the number of people driving their kids and dropping them off and just the number of students in, in our middle schools, and, and that's not just Cimarron. It's, it's across the board in most of our middle schools. Um, we have middle school and high school sharing a campus and parking lots. And uh, there's a lot of congestion converging on in a small area. Uh, and pressure points. So Rich, I don't know if there's anything you want to add, but you know, I just want to be real with you and I understand. Uh, I've also been through it and even leaving in the morning for me uh, to get to work, to get to schools, I have to adjust my time. And at Cimarron, my goal is to be uh, passing through before 7 a.m., even if it's by a few minutes, what a major difference it makes in time. So I'm going to speak specifically specific to that school since you called it out, but I'd say we probably all know our times of each of our schools. 
So, Mr. Wise, thank you. And thanks for the great question. I'm also a parent of two high school students. So we monitor the time. I know there's a lot of self-regulating that is required and happens uh, within the first two weeks back from full in person. I will say for Simron in particular, we have approximately 100 less students than we had when Simron was at its peak. So there are less students there. There is, uh, instead of a two mile radius for busing right now, because of the shortage of drivers. Um, we have three miles instead of two miles. So it's that extra one mile that we're hypersensitive to, and it could increase the number of drivers uh, versus those taking the bus. Um, but also I will say that with the recent survey, when we returned to normal loaded busing, there were a number that said they uh, may not right now take busing, but they may sign up for smart tag um, once they either experience the traffic or they become more importantly comfortable with normally loaded buses. So we are tracking that, but that's, that's a very good question. Thank you, Mr. Cosgrove. Appreciate uh, your expertise tonight. Uh, and thank you to Suzanne who was very patient and did not roll her eyes too hard. At me while uh, we loaded Mr. Mr. Wise back into the Zoom here. Uh, we're going to move on now. We've got some questions regarding health and safety protocols at our schools as we return to in-person learning uh, full-time for secondary students. This first one comes from Linda, uh, and she'd like to know, how will social distancing be maintained when schools are filled to capacity? Yeah, so great question, Linda. Um, just like our elementary schools, you know, social distancing we are working with Tri-County and working with each of our schools to try to create social distancing as much as possible. Uh, working with Dr. Douglas, who was a part of our, our last board meeting, you know, they understand that, that in a school when it's full capacity, lunchroom um, will be full. Uh, what we want to do is look at those other mitigating factors, even classrooms where you have 30 students. Um, you know, we want to create and use our space as much as possible but the six feet distance has been reduced. And then we are also at times not gonna even necessarily have three feet distance. Hence, we're gonna rely on other. What, what Tri-County and other recommendations say is you wanna use as many of those mitigating factors as possible. So we will encourage and try to have social distancing as much as possible, especially in those rooms and settings that we can. But we're also gonna make sure that everyone's wearing masks. Wearing masks and wearing the appropriate masks is critical. So we're going to continue to do that for the rest of this year. We want everyone to continue to, to use a hand sanitizer, to wash hands, um, to be aware of what you're around um, and practice those things. You know, we said it earlier with, with the self-quarantine. If you're at all feeling ill or might have been exposed, stay home. We can get you caught up on stuff. So, so take in those, uh, those other uh, mitigating points, and, and we're going to make sure we do that. You know, we disinfect the school every night. We try to hit tight touch points during the day. Um, so there's different factors that we try to build in. And each of those is what we've done at different points of the year, whether it be in hybrid or full in person at the elementary. And then we'll also do it at the middle school and high school level. Great. Thank you, Mr. Wise. Uh, I think along those same lines, you touched on it a little bit, and that's not a pun. Sorry. Uh, we do have a question from Shelly regarding um, just disinfecting protocols. Uh, with the return to full-time in-person learning. And, and I know that we talked on uh, touch points a little bit, but what else are we doing at our schools to make sure that they're properly disinfected? Yeah, so, you know, I'm going to have Rich Cosgrove come back on. I think Rich can do a great job of talking about um, our disinfecting protocols, what we try to do. Um, you know, as we talked about, we we have a number of things in place at our schools. Uh, we we do work on our ventilation, have a great system of, of working on, on that we have specialty rooms and our uh, electives. So performing arts, PE, along with specialty in the elementary where uh, we also have uh, uh, air purifiers and, and then we work on disinfecting and touch points throughout the day. You know, most importantly, I think it's that self side of, of how we continue working on those mitigating factors. But Rich, you wanna add any more detail? And, and we did kind of, you know, discuss this a little bit, but what else uh, would you like to add? So thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Wise. So yeah, as, uh, as stated, every touch point that is a light switch, a doorknob, a door handle, a push bar, 
Um, and every horizontal surface on every room, that is a, uh, a countertop, a table, a desk, it is disinfected at least once a day. And uh, staff does have disinfectant spray if they choose to do additional disinfections. CDC requires at least once a day. We do more than that. Um, every custodial contractor and bill engineer perform those duties. In addition to that, uh, anytime there's a positive case, we do a deep disinfection, and that's every single night in every room, including commons areas for any positive cases. As Mr. Wise said, we have increased our ventilation. We do uh, weather dependent. We do two flushes of the entire HVAC system every day before and after school. And, um, and on, on top of that, um, we have air purifiers distributed in any high use areas uh, throughout all of our schools. So um, hope that answers your question. Thanks, Rich. I know we're keeping you busy tonight. Thank you so much for being with us. We'll give you, a, I don't know, we'll give you next week off of school. How about that? Uh, our next question comes to us from Erica, uh, and she uh, has some questions regarding symptom checks. Uh, she wants to know, will there be daily COVID testing for students and staff in schools uh, as we return full-time in person? Yeah, so, you know, the, the, the COVID checks are available in a number of ways. Um, so we try, to have, we try to have the availability through your own primary care physicians or through our resources through Colorado COVID check, MACO, and, and at Douglas County High School. So we have sites available for you to set up those testing. Available each day? Um, no, we don't have those services right now provided for you. Um, so it's a partnership between the two. It's a partnership to try to, to, try to provide access and availability um, within that. So um, Lisa, anything else you might wanna add? And I think I covered that pretty well just in, in, in the straightness of that answer. But, but I would encourage you to use that testing. Also during, if you ever are quarantined, use that testing it helps you get back earlier. It also helps us look at that transmission rate. Um, it also you know, gives a lot of data to Tri-County to predict out for the future and what we can do with our quarantine processes. So if students are quarantined, please, please, please reach out and, and schedule a time to get, to get tested. Um, and I think that's most, most critical in that time frame. Just like we talked about if you're traveling, if you're out and about, get tested, um, use it. So um, Lisa, any other details that I might've missed or, or you wanna clarify? Nate, was the, the question about symptom check or COVID check? I, I the question regard is regarding COVID testing for students and, and staff at okay. school. Yeah, so I believe you covered it, Mr. Wise. Thanks, Lisa. Mm -hmm. That's what I get for blabbering on too much. Lisa, you get next week off too. Uh, so we're going to move on to a question from Beth. Uh, this one is uh, covering COVID vaccines. Beth would like to know, will students who have had a COVID vaccine be required to quarantine uh, when there is a case at school? Yeah, so um, students who receive a vaccine after the 14 days, so both vaccinations after 14 days, or I believe the Johnson & Johnson, which, which is a single vaccination after 14 days, um, will not have to quarantine. Um, now, as, as Mrs. Cancer stated, there's times you might have symptoms and we're gonna say, to self-isolate or stay home, um, because anytime you have symptoms, you have a cold or whatever else, we'd say stay home regardless, because we, we're still learning on this process. But, but the uh, overall answer is um, any person with a vaccination after 14 days, two vaccinations after 14 days, uh, will not have to quarantine. I'm getting a head nod from Lisa, so I think that's pretty spot on. But while I do have Lisa here, um, I thought I would just sort of bring up the same question uh, conversation that we, that we had during the staff town hall, and, and that is how are uh, COVID vaccines going for our DCSD staff? We've, we've been doing our vaccination sites uh, for a couple of weeks now. Uh, what have you seen, Lisa? Once the uh, distribution patterns increased, um, it has been truly remarkable how, um, how quickly our partners have offered uh, vaccination opportunities to all of our staff. So at this point, we're uh, very excited and proud to say that anybody uh, who has wanted a vaccine has had an opportunity to schedule it, which is, um, as Mr. Wise referenced earlier, a, a remarkable feat. 
So we are extremely grateful to all of our healthcare partners and providers who have uh, worked with us to create those opportunities. There's um, folks who are still in the process of getting their second vaccinations coming soon, um, which um, some folks get side effects from, but we're prepared for that as well. Um, and then uh, two weeks after that, we'll have another large group of staff members who uh, are fully vaccinated. So it's been incredible. That's great news. And we are, like you said, we're fortunate. We've got a lot of great health partners here in Douglas County and, and Colorado that have, uh, have been really great to partner with over the last year. Tough circumstances, but it's good to have those folks in our corner. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks for being with us tonight. Uh, that's actually going to bring us to the end of our town hall. And I know people are always heartbroken when we come to the end of these things, um, but we spent a really strong hour together. And to close us out, I would love to have Mr. Wise give us a few closing remarks uh, before we, we head off to enjoy our Tuesday evening. Yeah. First off, uh, Nate, thanks to you. Thanks to one, your personality, your humor, making it fun, uh, bringing a smile to our face. Everyone that's out there, I appreciate you taking the time. Um, you know, getting invested and asking questions, uh, being a part of challenging times, to create understanding uh, is huge. So, so appreciate it. I also want you to know I'm so proud of, of the work that's happening. Um, you know, there's, I know there's a lot of frustration. I know that there's, there's a lot of, uh, of things that, that each of us are, are working on and, and struggling with. But also, I want you to think about everything that's going well. You know, I think there's a lot of positive we need to find. And, and I encourage us as we go into spring break, as we think about spring, you know, I really want to think about a, a new opportunity and finding the bright spots. And we're going to have we're going to have bumps in the road. But how we work together on those and how how we continue to define what's working and how we continue to improve and get better. Um, you know, the empathy side of putting ourselves in other shoes and create understanding and ask so we can uh, have more perception and, and understanding and that I, I think is critical. You know, I wanna say thank you to, to all the teachers and staff. They are, they've taken on so much and this has been a transformational year in education. But I also wanna say thank you to all the community. You know, those of you, I, I get it as a parent, it's a different year, it's harder. It's challenging like we never experienced. Those of you who've taken on more, like Michelle and others that are subbing, it's not just for our district, but I get that we're all taking on more. So just thank you for the work that each of you put on. And also with our students, you know, getting around talking to students about what's working, what's not, and, and the extra effort that they're putting in and trying to understand those things. I, I just truly want to just uh, tell you how proud I am, you know, even in tough times, even where maybe there's not agreement, even when there's a lot of emotion, you know, we, we're doing great things. When you compare us with other areas and districts, um, there's a lot of struggle. There's nothing perfect out there. Every time we think everything's at that other side, the grass is greener or better. Uh, I think when you really look into it, we're all facing challenges and struggles. And to accentuate our, our fantastic community, the people, people make the difference. And every time I reach out and have a conversation, a phone call, get to a school and talk with a teacher or talk with students and, and in the parking lot, you know, have the ability to ask parents how it's going and listen. I just can't tell you how much, uh, how proud I am of just listening to each of you and, and, and taking a little time to build a bit of a relationship, a bit of an understanding. And uh, I think that's what's needed. So, so I'd ask you to please pass it along, pass it along as you talk with your neighbors at the grocery store, um, pass it along as you work with, uh, with your schools, your teachers, with your kids, uh, because we're going to look back on this year and think about not only the challenge, but also everything we got through and, uh, and, and find that, that, that idea of, wow, we, we accomplished quite a bit more than we were expecting. And we learned more about ourselves um, than probably we realize right now. So I just, and I want to acknowledge that. And, you know, I hope you have a great spring break. Uh, we need, everyone needs it. So I hope you get to slow down, enjoy it. You know, please think about those things of impact on others and then get tested and do the, those things also. But, um, you know, and spring break is there for a purpose and, and I wish you the best. And I look forward to our fourth quarter. I look forward to, to being back full PK-12 uh, in person and what we have to accomplish and, and what we build from there. So um, thanks to all of you. Thanks to our board of volunteers and, and Spencer time. And, and, uh, and then lastly, to Nate, to, to Chris 